Real Life Real Crime is a true crime podcast brought to you by Woody Overton and executive producer Toby Tomplay. of acts of violence or that are of a sexual nature. It should be for people that are 18 years or older. Heed my warning, people. I do not get the facts of these cases off the internet or from some television show. The facts we're retelling you were presented to us by the victims of the crimes or the perpetrators who committed the crimes against the victims. My description of the crime scenes or what I saw with my own two eyes. If you're going to get offended, please turn this podcast off now. Thank you. Started. We're doing a live tonight from Rapids Parish Courthouse. Just according to Coco, Rapids Burning. Uh, but this is a, a national, September 25th, it's a national memorial for murder victims. And that's what we're here tonight for when we speak at it. Stay tuned. other a lot and we help each other a lot but uh, I want to welcome everybody unfortunately we're meeting
because we are all affected by murder in some way, form, or fashion. And it's just, it's a, it's a part, a group that you don't want to be a part of. Like next year, we might have to have three tables and I, and each year my list keeps getting bigger and I just would just pray that it would just end and no more names would be added or no more pictures would be added. But unfortunately it is. So at this time, at this time, I would like to, we're going to open with a prayer and invite Father Kenneth Michelle's up to come say a prayer for us. Putting ourselves now in the presence of Almighty God in the midst of our grief and our hope, in the midst of our joy and our sufferings, let us find solace in Psalm 13, which reads thus, How long, Lord, will you utterly forget me? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I carry sorrow in my soul, grief in my heart day after day? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look upon me, answer me, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, lest I sleep in death. Let my enemies say I have prevailed, lest my foes rejoice at my downfall. I trust in your faithfulness. Grant my heart joy in your help, that I may sing of the Lord, how good our God has been to me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. I'm going to tell y'all a little bit of history about uh, the POMC and why we are here for September the 25th. Um, in 1978, Charlotte and Robert Huliger had a 19-year-old daughter. Her name was Lisa. And she went, she was a senior in high school in Cincinnati, Ohio. And she went abroad to Germany to study in a, a, a work-study program. And she met a guy there. And they dated for about six months. And um, she could tell that the relationship was a toxic relationship and it wasn't a good one. And she wanted to break off her relationship with him. And he didn't want that to happen. And so he lured her back to his house. And this was they both lived in Germany. They were both in the same work study program. Um, and he beat her to death with a sledgehammer. And she did make it to the hospital, but she never regained consciousness. And she died 13 days later. And her parents, didn't have any support group or anything, anybody to talk to. Um, and there was a priest. His name was Ken, and I probably will not say it right, but Schlitz, Schlitz, Hiller, Schlitzler. And he got them together with two other families, and they met in their living room of their home. And that was their first time to have a support group for murder victims. It was in 1978. But September the 25th was Lisa's birthday. So in the year 2007, her parents got the U.S. Supreme Court to sign into September 25th as a national day of remembrance in all 50 states. And there is a gathering like this going on all over the country. And it's unfortunate, but we need each other. And had those two people not lost their daughter, 
we would not be here today. So we, we wouldn't have a, a gathering where we could share our hurts and our sorrows. But today is a day of remembrance. Everybody has had some people who had justice, some people have not had justice. There has been good and bad in all. Some people were thrown into this, not knowing, never being in a courtroom before. But what we're here for today is not the right or wrong or the good or bad or justice or no justice. It's to remember our loved ones. So we're just gonna remember that and after a while, we're going to have an open mic where if anybody wants to get up and say a story of their loved one, they'd be more than welcome. But one thing I have learned, and I've been on this journey for almost 16 years in just a few days. The worst day of my life was October the 4th. But I, I know one thing's for certain that murder does not discriminate. It affects people young and old. It affects people of all races, religions. Rich, poor, it, it doesn't matter. And I've learned that and, and it's a really, really hard thing to accept. And I just know that by me and Edna and all of us being together just kind of helps a little bit of, gives you a little bit of soothing to your heart because you know that you are not in this alone. And if there's anything we can ever do, you can find us both on Facebook and if you want our phone numbers, we'll be glad to give it to you. If you ever need to talk or just cry or not say anything, just just sit there and, and let us talk to you. It doesn't matter, we're here for you. And without friends and family and people that understand I don't know what I would have done. And I... I would just like to thank everyone for coming out this evening. Um, I would like to thank our guest speakers in advance for being here. Um, it's an honor and a privilege for me to be able to keep my daughter, Shaquina Robinson's memory alive. I don't ever want her forgotten. Um, I told someone a minute ago, if I have to stand on that building up there and say, remember her? She was the body that they found in the dumpster by Joe's Grocery in mm -hmm. January 2010. It's a day that I live every day. I relive that day over and over. And from one mother to another, know that we are here for you. Our numbers are on the flyers. We will give you our numbers. You can call us anytime, day or night. We have your back. Thank you. At this time, I would like to invite up our newly elected sheriff, Mr. Mark Wood, to come and say a few words. Thank you, Ms. Stephanie. You know, a few years back when this started, I was always in the back because uh, this is a group, I cannot sit here and tell you I know how you feel. I can't do it. Uh, you know, my heart reaches for you. Some of the stories that I've heard, uh, Mr. Prestridge, the daughter way back, I remember that. I was 24 years old when that happened. 
You know, what do you say at a time like this? Y'all go through stuff every day that we can only imagine. Just like the fourth every day, I'm sure is a, a terrible day for Miss Stephanie to wake up. Miss LeBoer. You know, and I see the faces, and I guess what's sad is what she said a while ago. There's always new faces every time we come here every year. I see new faces, and that's sad. I didn't think I would ever be up here speaking to y'all, and, and I'm honored that I was asked to do this. You know, Eric, again, what do you say? What can I say to you? But to promise, I see the shirt, never forget, never give up, never. That's all you can do. I mean, you know, to lose a loved one in a violent manner has, has got to be the ultimate. I, I just, you know, I, I just don't know what to say to you. Other than I pray for you. I pray that God gives you peace and help you get through this. But I promise you every year I'll be back here with you to stand with you and to help you. And if you need me, you call me. You know, I'll, I'll do anything I can for you. Because this group right here has lived through some horrible, tragic, tragic times. May God bless y'all. May he give you peace. And I promise you, you are in my thoughts and my prayers. And you will stay there. And I have taken on a job that I will see a lot of this. And I have seen a lot of this. Just this week, you know, I have ladies that reach out to me crying about their ex-husband or their boyfriend. I tell them, you know, it's, it's only going to get worse. You've got to get away. You've got to get away from there. It's going to get worse. It doesn't stop. So with that said, I'm, I'm you know, I won't be, I, I love listening to the stories. I, I see the pain. I see the hurt. That guy's a boy come up here and speak. And once again, I pray God gives you peace. I really, really do. Thank you, Miss Steph. beautiful and we appreciate you um, is mr. Jermaine Harris here there he is come on up mr. Jermaine we want to see if you want to say a few words mr. Jermaine is assistant uh, former assistant DA and he's an attorney here in town and I invited him to come and say a few words. Thank you. Uh, once again, like Sheriff Wood, uh, I'm honored to be able to address you here this evening. Uh, this event is an important event. Um, it's important to remember those that we lost, uh, that we should not have lost. Um, also like Sheriff Wood mentioned, I also uh, can't understand and don't know how you feel uh, when it comes to a close family member, but I do know how it feels when it comes to a close family friend. Um, there was a close family friend of ours that uh, lost his life. He was, he was murdered a few years ago. Uh, when he was younger, uh, maybe around first, second grade, he stayed at my mom's house for a year. And for that year, he stayed there. I was in college. so. Whenever I would come home, I would see him, you know, interact with him, and, and we had a close relationship with his family. Um, a memory of his that I remember was he was in first or second grade, and he was getting off the bus. I was home from school, and it was a loose dog running around uh, the street. And so I knew my brother was coming home on the bus, and I knew little Jay was coming home on the bus. So I wanted to make sure, I said, well, let me make sure in case they get off the bus and there's any trouble I'll look out and watch for him. And so I must have got busy. And so when I looked out the window, I saw little Jay and he was coming uh, towards the house and the dog was following him. And he had his book sack on, he had a paper bag 
and he was like arguing or how we say fussing with the dog and so he was telling the dog to move and he was holding the bag up and so I came outside I told him no come in the house and so I asked him I said well what were you telling the dog he said I was telling the dog to move he said uh, I said well what's in your bag he said well I have some candy in here the dog was trying to get this candy and so that's why he was holding the candy up high and trying to get away from the dog and so uh, that's, that's one of my favorite memories of his and at the age I want to say about 18 um, he was shot and killed here in Alexandria. And I remember being at the funeral, and I remember seeing him, and I remember thinking to myself about the potential that was lost. And I didn't just think about the potential that was lost, I thought about it for him, and I thought about it for so many other people whose potential was gone. Life experiences that he would never get to have um, was gone, you know. As an assistant district attorney, I spent a lot of time dealing with families and talking with families who have dealt with losing a loved one uh, to a homicide. And one of the things that they shared in common, well, a couple of things. One thing that they almost all wanted was their voice to be heard. That's number one. They all wanted their voice to be heard. And of course, the other thing they all wanted was justice. And I had many of them tell me, listen, if for some reason we can't get justice like we want, they told me that if we can't get justice like we want, we wanna know that you did everything possible to bring us justice. And if you can do that, we'd be satisfied with that. And, and that always stuck with me because it made you wanna work that much harder to make sure that family uh, had justice. So I, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Uh, I want to say uh, I keep you all in my heart, all in my prayers. Uh, God bless each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jermaine. Um, my sister-in-law, we have a little support group, a monthly support group, and my sister-in-law is... Um, a, our counselor there. Her name is Janice Miller, and I would like to invite her up now to come and maybe give us some words of comfort, hope, strength. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Sometimes either I talk too loud or not loud enough, so just let me know if you can't hear me. Um, as Stephanie said, uh, Courtney was my niece, her parents, Bobby and Stephanie Belgard, my brother and sister-in-law. Um, and we lost Courtney 16 years ago, the way each of you have lost a loved one through a violent, senseless act, murder. And as Stephanie and others have said, this isn't a group we want to be a part of, but we are all so thankful that we have this group, that we have people that can come together that understand because they too have, have suffered and they are suffering. And so we come together and our voices are heard through strength, our support and love is felt through numbers. And so it, it, it's just wonderful. It's wonderful to see so many people. It's horrible to think that every year the number grows, but it's wonderful to see that there's a place that we can come there is a way that we can come together to seek justice, seek peace, seek comfort and healing and remembrance, remembrance of each of our loved ones because they've gone on, they're no longer suffering, but we are still here suffering. And we, we never, ever, as Edna said, we never, ever want anyone to forget who our loved one was. They had a life and it was taken from them. And we do want justice for each and every one of them. What we want to do when we come together here each year is to remember their life, their love, their spirit, because that is still alive. Love is eternal. So as Stephanie was saying, for those of you who don't know me, I'm also a licensed professional counselor. I have a mental health counseling practice here in Alexandria. And I work with other people daily who also are struggling um, through grief, some through 
their loved one being murdered, some through accident, some through natural death, but always a loss, and there's that grief. And when they initially come to me, they say, I don't, I don't think I can do this. I, I can't make it. I'm not strong enough. I don't want to live anymore. I, I hurt too bad. I can't take this pain anymore. So we begin that journey together. And most of them, I, I see them anywhere from six months to a year. I have one lady I've been seeing for almost two years. So no one can tell you where you are in your journey or where you should be or what you should be feeling. This is your journey. This is your loved one. And you have a right. You have a right to feel what you feel and to breathe as you breathe. But you will live. And we will go forward. And we will go forward and we will keep our loved ones alive and their spirits alive. Their love, as I said, is eternal. So what I wanted to say when I was thinking about what did I want to share with you all tonight, well, one thing Stephanie added was that we do have a support group. So first of all, I do want to invite any of you and all of you who are looking for some place to go and, and just, you don't have to come. There's no membership required. You don't have to show up every month. But the second Thursday of each month, we meet at the West Side Library at 5.30. So our next meeting is Thursday, October 8th, 5.30. And um, any time, any second Thursday of the month that you just need some extra support, you just want to be among people who understand, please come and join us. We'd love to have you. Um, what I wanted to say tonight is, you know, Often I talk to people when we have our monthly support group and in my own private practice about self-care. As you're on your own, as you are on your own journey and trying to figure this out, how do I get up in the morning? How do I, how do I live with this, this huge void that will never be filled? Because that person that filled that was gone. How do I do this? So one way is honoring your loved one. Another is self-care. See, you will go on and live, but will you come through this stronger? Will you come through this moving forward and honoring and loving and pushing forward for your loved one, for yourself, for your other family and friends and loved ones that are still here that depend on you? That depends. Are you taking care of yourself? So the two things is, is self-care and then finding a way to honor your loved one. And I spend time with, with all of my clients talking to them about that. Self-care, loving yourself, being kind to yourself. There's something called survivor guilt. You may or may not feel it. I don't know if you have felt it. If your loved one was murdered, there's always the questions of, and I know we went through this. I've heard Stephanie say it right after they found Courtney's body, and it was, if I had just made her go with us, they went camping that weekend and they asked Courtney to go. And she's like, no, don't want to do it. Got plans for friends tonight. And so it's like, if I just made her go with me, she'd still be here. It's called survivor guilt and it's very natural. If I had just done, or maybe if, or if only I had said, or I wish I would have, that's natural. But remember, you had nothing nothing that you could have done that would have changed this. Evil is in the world, and evil will be in the world until our Lord and Savior comes and, and brings peace and, 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 and ends it. But until then, it's going to be here. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do to survive? So there's nothing. Survivor guilt is normal. It's natural. It's part of grieving. But be kind to yourself. If you need to cry, cry. I tell my clients, I don't worry as much about people who cry as people who can't cry. That's, that's a problem. And if you're there, please reach out to someone. Reach out to a counselor. Go see your doctor. If you need an antidepressant, that's not uncommon either. Why? Because your brain has had an enormous pull on it. Enormous. Your neurotransmitters, all the chemicals in your brain that are there to keep our mood stable, to keep us happy, to work through sad times, to work through stressful times. Anxiety and depression are on overload, on steroids. So it's okay if you need medication, go see someone. It's called situational depression. If you need to cry, you cry. If you need to be with loved ones and you need to laugh, 
You need to share funny stories. You know, Mr. Harris was up here a moment ago sharing his favorite story about his childhood friend. That's, that's wonderful. That's, that's part of healing and it's part of honoring our loved one. So it's okay. It's okay to laugh. It's okay to share stories. So whatever you need, provide that for yourself. Take care of yourself. Be kind to yourself. Get extra rest. Some of you are fresh in this journey. Some of you, it's been, like for our family, 16 years. It isn't a time limited. It isn't a time limited event. You know, you saw Stephanie break down momentarily up here, 16 years ago. It's okay. You need to cry 15, 20, 25 years from now. Or if you want to laugh about something funny the day after. We shared some really cute stories about Courtney at the funeral, you know? so. It, it's okay. You do what you need to do. Self-care. Get some sleep. Stay hydrated. You don't feel like eating. Make yourself eat. And then treat yourself to a blizzard if you want to. It's okay. Comfort food's not a bad thing. But, but eat. Sleep. Stay hydrated. Get some exercise. Get out and go for a walk. Forgive yourself. Be kind to yourself. That's self-care. Honoring your loved one. That's the other one. So... Find some way to honor your loved one. In the support group last year, I believe, around the holidays, I challenged this person to, to think of something about the holidays that, that they could do that would remind them, keep their, their loved one there present with them, and honor them, bring honor to them. See, some people think that's too hard. They just want to forget about that. That isn't true. That's what we think. That's what our brain is trying to escape and run from it tells us. But what we found was we had someone come back after the holidays, or well, some even said it before the holidays, that this is what they were going to do. And they talked about how their loved one loved to decorate a tree and what they liked to do with the tree and how bad they always decorated the tree. They were going to make sure the tree was just as messy as they used to do it and just the things on it that they used to put on there. You know, some talked about other things that they wanted to do. Some people go out to the cemetery and they... They have something special that they want to bring out there and place on the grave of their loved one. Um, other people do other things, like start um, start a movement. And you know what? Like Stephanie said, this came about from people back in the 70s who lost their 19-year-old daughter. But it grew. And when it came here, this group, as I'm looking out here tonight, everyone who's here, my sister-in-law is responsible for getting it here. She, one person, don't think you can't make a difference. Don't think you can't be that voice for your loved one. She honors Courtney every day in her life, but this, this vigil every year, the support group that we do every month, there was no support group here. All of that is because of one mother who said, I am hurting so bad I don't know if I can go on. But if I have to live without my little girl, I'm going to make sure that I have her known to everyone, that I'm her voice, and that I use this platform, my tragedy, her death, to help others <coughs> who are also going through what I'm going through. And she made it her mission. And she has. That's how she honors Courtney every day. So find something, whether it's planting a tree for your loved one or, or doing something on their birthday. I have a client, he's a little boy that lost his dad this year. And uh, his mom put him in therapy with me because his father's birthday and Father's Day was all coming up about the same time. And he, he was really having a tough time. So... I started talking to him about, you know, how can you honor, honor your father? How about, and we started brainstorming. So long story short, he came up with the idea that he wanted him and his mom to go have a picnic out there at his dad's grave. His mom thought that was a horrible idea, <laughs> horrible idea. She thought it was just going to be a horrible day. She was struggling too. But they did it. She did it for her little boy. And the next week when he came in, he was just beaming. And I reminded him that when we are happy, when we're bringing honor, when we're joyful, the spirit of our loved one is there with us. 
and they feel that, they know that. They cannot have any part of pain and sorrow. But you can really feel their spirit there when there's joy and happiness. And he said they had the best time, and they really just felt like they were there with his dad. He said he, they had a picnic, and they talked and laughed, and, and he said it was really good. And his mother said, and it was really good for me, too. So, just want to leave you with that, that little tidbit. Think of something. Think of something you can do to keep your, your loved one's memory alive and honor them and take care of yourself. And hopefully we'll see some of you on uh, October the 8th at the support group. That was so special. Thank you, Janice. Um, I see Mr. Corline here, and I know Mr. Corline always likes to come up and give us a few words of hope. Would you, do you feel up to it, Mr. Corline? Oh, yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> He's one of our big victims advocates. Every March, every, we do a Victims Rights Week and we have a march and we walk to the Family Justice Center and Mr. Corline's always there with us. <coughs> Haven't seen you in a while. Oh. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, I didn't realize Miss Stephanie was going to have me speak, but I sure appreciate it. Uh, as I shared with some of y'all last year, my uncle was a murder victim back in uh, 1999, I believe. And it was a friend of his that murdered him. And you know, something Sheriff Woods said up here about the people that he has been talking to this week. I want to talk to those that are in some sort of abusive relationship tonight. Or you may know someone that's in an abusive relationship. We know that domestic violence in Louisiana is skyrocketing. We see it in law enforcement every day. But we want these people, and it's not just women, we want these victims to know that they do have a way out, but they have to ask for it. Remember, silence perpetuates the violence. They have got to come forward, because we will help you. Believe me, we would much rather help you get out of a violent situation than have to investigate your murder. And that is something that we in law enforcement, we never forget. We never forget those victims. These deputies and police officers that go to these calls, they give these ladies or gentlemen these cards of resources that they can ask for to help, and then they have to go back one night and work a homicide. That is something that, again, we never forget. But thank all of y'all uh, Ms. Robinson, I think, said it best that we want to remember and we will never forget. We will remember these victims. We will remember the people that have been parts of our lives. Never forget and never give up hope. Thank you all very much and God bless you all. I'm sorry I put you on the spot like that. At this time, I would like to invite up Woody Overton. Woody is a very dear friend to my family. Um, he found his passion in solving cold <coughs> cases, and he, he has a lot of wisdom about this what we're going through, and I want to just let him say a few words. Thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for having me. Um, y'all, like I said earlier, y'all are all part of a club that nobody has to join. And my name's Woody Overton. 
and I was a career law enforcement professional. I spent most of my career working homicides. And y'all forgive me because I'm unscripted and all, but so I would just bounce around for a bit. But people oftentimes ask me, I said, Woody, how do you deal with all the bad things that you've seen? How do you deal with the images in your head and the bad guys that you had, girls, people that you had to deal with, all these things? And I always tell them, I guess I'm lucky. I don't have PTSD. I'm one of the fortunate ones where I can block these things out. And then Miss Stephanie asked me last week to speak here tonight. And I thought about it and I realized I've been lying to myself all these years because there is one thing that's, that does eat at me. The one thing the majority of you here tonight have been a part of. And that's when I like to get a case and I would have to go to the family, however soon it was after the homicide. And I had to be the one to knock on that door and go in and tell them that their loved one was never coming home, that they are dead. And almost every one of them, the first question they ask is how, what happened, why? I would tell them what I could. Um, but at that moment, you're realizing you're forever changing, if not destroying, this person and these people's lives. And at that moment, that family member became my family member. And that's what gave me the motivation to drive to work those cases so hard. Because I, just like Courtney Coco. I have a picture on my bedside and I have it in my truck and I carry her with me every day. And every murder I've ever worked, I carry those families with me every day. And for those of you who have had justice or closure or whatever you want to call it, you know that justice doesn't bring, will never bring your family member back, okay? That's not gonna change but maybe you find some peace in it. And for those of you who haven't, I'll pray for you. Just keep the faith. And the one thing I would say on, on this night of remembrance is, and I did at some point, you know, talking to the family members, at some point, you know, at a later date, they were, they were going through stages of grief and they would want to know more details or we were preparing them for trial or whatever. And they want to know the details. And I, would, and I said, you know what? And I would ask y'all to do this. Don't concentrate. Don't forget, and you're never gonna forget that they were a victim of murder. Don't concentrate on those last seconds and how they died. Concentrate on how they live. Think about the good things. Think about their smile. Think about how they made you laugh. Sometimes made you mad. Sometimes made you cry. Think about how they loved you and you loved them. Remember that. You're never gonna forget about the homicide. Try to dwell on the good things. Carry that with you. Because Whatever deity you pray to or God you believe in, I'm telling you, they're with them now. They're not suffering anymore. Amen. We as humans are here to carry that load and that pain and that anguish. So when that pain and that anguish pops in, you gotta deal with it, like she, uh, like she said. You don't have to hide from it. I mean, it's always gonna be there. But try to remember the good things. And thank you for having me. God bless y'all. Thank you so much. Those were very encouraging words. Okay, at this time, after um, we've had all of our guest speakers, um, we open up the mic. 
um, to any family members that want to speak. And I'm going to start with um, Lynn Courtney. She's going to share a little story about her brother. And then if anybody else wants to come up and speak, um, they can come up and share. And I'm sorry, we can't control the wind. We lost our marbles again. <laughs> <laughs> this is Courtney Tate, and she's going to read y'all a little something. My name is Courtney Tate. My baby brother, Dangerous Henderson, was murdered on June 10, 2018. It was the hearing street shooting. My brother was 20 years old. I lost my baby brother, my best friend, my look like all in just a matter of minutes. My world for, changed forever. I can still remember the day like it happened yesterday. The hurt and pain at that moment was so unbearable. One thing about my brother, I could count on him for anything. I can rem I have, I've had many restless nights reliving that moment like it was just in the fear of waking up to another call. I can remember these, these times when we would disagree, but he would protect me. If anyone would bother me, he would say, leave my baby sister alone. Remember, I just told y'all he was my, my baby brother. With the blank stare, I would look at him like I'm older than you, and he would say, well, I'm taller than you, and he was my big brother. <laughs> the most hurtful image of his death still taunts me as I watched during his trial the video of his death. I will forever have the video in my memory forever. With God's help, I get through each day with his grace and mercy. I am mourning the loss of so many hopes and dreams and expectations. Dangerous death has left me vulnerable and scared to face life without him by my side and forever saddened that he will never be able to realize his dream. I love you, David. Today, as we honor those of, for a National Day of Remembrance, let us remember my brother, David Henderson, who was killed senselessly. It has left a hole in my heart in this world. Thank you. She's so brave. I have a little lady. Her name is Jordan, and she wants to talk about her uncle Thomas. Come on up, baby. My name is Jordan, and I'm the niece of Thomas Coochie Jr., and I wanted his name to be heard over everybody here and all over the world because I want people to know that he was actually a good, caring person, and he touched so many lives because his funeral was over five miles long, and he touched so many people's hearts because he was just kind and just like, everything and everybody loves him i don't know who like didn't like him but everybody like i just we all loved him and we all miss him a lot and we wanted or i wanted him to just be hurt all over because i mean he's a good person and he was just really funny and he was just there and yeah She was going to cry, but I told her it was okay if she did. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But she did good. Yeah. And part yeah, of did. part of talking about it is healing. Mm -hmm. Trust me. It's it, you can't pretend like the big elephant in the room, and you just keep walking around. Sometimes you just got to face it and talk mm -hmm. about it. Um, would anybody else like to come up and share a story? <laughs> My name is Pamela, and I just want to share my story on three loved ones getting, getting killed. First was my brother trying to break up a fight. He ended up losing his life. He got stabbed like eight times. Then my son that was sitting there found out there at the park on Monroe Street. My granddaughter, Kaisha, she got her brains blown out. Did it have anything to do with what her boyfriend did? But they took her too, but to leave no witness. 
And as I stand up here, it's something very painful nobody would want to go through or to, but I did. And I begin to question God and say, God, why me? Why me? And the voice say, why not you? Yes. And it said, I don't put no more in than you can bear. Right. And I didn't seem yeah. to understand it. And I was just walking, looking for love in all the wrong places after they was buried. Until I come into somebody that go disappoint me and invited me. And I have been coming here for the last so many years. And all I can do is just tell God, I just thank you, Lord, you know, for what I went through and what you brought me to. My son was causing, didn't bother anyone, had little mental mild mental problems, walking down my real street, talk to himself or whatever, but didn't give anyone no right. And it was a lady, no right to put Fidna in his walk. And she knew me, she, I'm not gonna call her name, she grew up with me. And I told her, I shared some words with her, I said, you know what, go around, come around. And as I stand up here tonight, her son is in jail on rape charges, two of them. And I didn't have to touch him, but I hate that it had to go that way. The other one got her brains blown out. And my brother, like I said, trying to break up a fight and lost his life. And I just thank God that I'm still standing and not in Jackson. And God has really gave me the strength where I can tell another brother. Oh, sister, another mother or father. Just put your hands in God's hands. He'll be a mother, he'll be a father, he'll be a son, he'll be a daughter. But you got to trust. And when you cannot stand, get down and bend. If he did it for me, he'll do it for you. And I love all y'all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Patricia. Would you like to say something, Alan? <clears throat> I'm originally from Florida. Uh, I'm wearing that LSU hat tonight. <laughs> and uh, I want to tell you, I lost a son. My family lost my oldest son back in 1995 on December 10th. A great lead in to Christmases after that time period. Um, what I feel here is that you do, it does come around to the good things, good events that happen with me and my son. I'd like to thank my other son, Jason, for continuing to encourage me to come out here amongst the folks. Um, I've shied away from it a couple of times, but I'm here tonight and I'm blessed. And the memory I want to pass on about my son, he drove the truck for several years and he rode with me for a week in the truck and at night when we parked the truck, we played with our kids with opposition. About the third day out, he said, Dad, he said, can I say something without you getting mad? I said, sure. Rick, he said, you got to do something about this beat. <laughs> but I ended up getting some of that drunk and baby towel for this. But he was what hurt me a couple of things. When people didn't say, Mr. Craig, I'm sorry to hear about your son. When there's been enough time where people have moved on, that still hurt me. Uh, I now can say that my son's been gone six years longer than he was here. And that's a tough. And I'm, I'm, I'm the only tough, hurt tough guy. But I didn't think it was a lot of things that would knock me off my feet. But that did. And it almost cost me a lot of things a few years after that. But I recovered, and so can you. And I would say, be positive. They're with you. And Thank you for sharing that, Mr. Allen. And now I'd like for Mr. Perry. Um, I just met Mr. Perry today. Um, his wife was murdered, and um, I'm glad. We got to meet because he's going to be uh, one of our new people at our support group. 
and uh, he wants to say a few words. Uh, first thing, I want to give honor to God, and I want to say he's the pot and I'm the clay. Yeah. You know, uh, this here uh, murder, which I have two candles here because of two reasons. I want to because uh, my wife got married in 2006 over here in Wild Street. And my brother-in-law got married in 1992 over here on Park Street. Uh, both of them are cold cases. And I say I'll just say this, so when my wife got married, she left behind five kids. I was a recovering addict for five years clean. And that made me boost up, and this I have to say this here like this here. Some gonna live, and some gonna die. And some gonna die so others can live. But she gave me some strength through her death and gave me to keep, keep me pushing forward to raise our children. Yeah. You know, it, it was like uh, her birthday was uh, December 11th. And one day I was hurting so bad, I picked my Bible up and I read Revelation 12, 11. It said that those that overcame him by the blood of, of the Lamb shall have a testimony. Yeah. And my testimony is that, that, you know, death don't have to stop us, you know. You know, we, we have to keep going no matter what. And that was my story. I was sitting up at a meeting one day, and I was hurting so bad, and they were slapping domino bones, and they were talking about 25s and 30s, and my mind was registering other stuff, if you know what I mean. And I was sitting up in there, and I turned to my uh, page, and if you know what the, the number means, 33 to me, I turned to that page, and this is what it said in the second paragraph. It said that those that just because we get clean don't exempt us from pain. We might have to go through a death of a loved one, or. Or, or end up a relationship. But how about four children that I messed up whilst I was out there doing what I was doing? So I had to look back and look at myself and look at the man in the mirror and ask God to straighten me out. And almost now, it's almost going on 20 years. And uh, I'm grateful that, that my wife. So that's why I have to say that he's the potter and I'm the clay. Cause he made, I, I went through some things and I'm going through some things. But guess what? I don't know where my son at right now. I've been posting on Facebook that I don't know where he at. But I know one thing. I can say, man, I just thank God that I hope he gets to keep a heads of protection around him. Amen. I know I can't do it. And that's why that's where I'm at today, man. I'm just, I, I was anxious about coming up, up here tonight. And I'm truly grateful for being here. Because, I, you know, in our pain, sometimes pain share is pain less. Yeah. So that's where I'm at today. And I thank God for that. You did great, Mr. Perry. All right. Do we have another gentleman who wants to share? Uh, excuse me, uh, my name is Tim Wayne Jones. Uh, if y'all don't mind, it's not about a reason. It's not about a race or like that. I would like to tell you the very first. Father God in heaven, we ask you, Lord God, you are Father God. Do your will within us, Lord. Put your angels. That's not misleading, this guy, and this truth. It's not about it. things that we've done, wrong, or the mistakes we've made. It's about the Christian that we've taken forward, side to side, and not judging one another. So we ask you right now, Lord, about it. Just keep doing it. And we praise the Son, Lord. As far as our loved ones, this, this is in the grave. Our Father in Him has in here. I mean, 
their spirits with us. We have to hand down this. We've all made mistakes. We all still make some mistakes. God said we would be perfect. That don't mean we have to accept it. Mm -hmm. I just want to let y'all know that. My name is Tim Wayne Tim. And I love y'all with all my heart. And I thank y'all. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Have a very special thank you for sharing. Anybody else before we get started with our Come on up, Shay. Shay was two years old when her mother was murdered. And she's still here and she's fighting for justice for her mom. Uh, my name is Shay. My mama was Rebecca Ann Miller. Um, actually, I was three years old. Um, I turned three years old on December 5th and December 20th they found her decomposed body out in the middle of the woods. Um, she has been stabbed over 67 times. Um, she left behind, I'm the youngest of five. Um, we all, of my siblings, we all got separated with child services. Um, we just met only like a year ago. Um, but my mama, she always, I mean, yeah, my mama did, wasn't in some good things, but that woman would give you the shirt off of her back to anybody. She'd stand up for anybody, and she always loved her babies. She'd always say, I love my babies. I just love my babies. And when she didn't call for my birthday that December, my daddy kept going to my me and me and being like, Mama, something's wrong with Rebecca. I, I can't, I haven't seen her. Cause she'd walk everywhere. She'd walk from Woodward to Lee Street every day. And, uh, you know, we get, we got a call when my grandmother did. And they had found a Caucasian four, four eight, body and that she was the only Caucasian short prostitute of that time and it took dental records after go she we didn't bury her until a year later almost to the day um but I just wanted I just wanted her name to be heard I mean I literally feel like she has been forgotten and there's one thing if you ever see a picture of my mother I'm her twin <laughs> and I'm very blessed to carry around her face um, I will always she'll never be forgotten you know I will always have a hole in my heart for not having a mother you know but I like to think that I'm going to get to do the things she never got to and, you know, I just, it's, you know, it hasn't been solved. And I just, you know, we're trying, it's been 18 years. And, you know, um, time that, I mean, I didn't even hardly even know my mother, really, to be honest with y'all. There's only three. And that still hurts. I mean, the feeling of not having a mother not to have somebody to hold you during breakups, to have, you know, your mother's supposed to be, a mother and daughter bond's always supposed to be so close. And the fact that I, I feel like I was cheated out of that. And then the fact, you know, they just made her out, like, made her out to be this horrible person. It, it's not right, it's not fair. But there's one thing for sure. I will make sure until the day I die that she, that everybody knows that 
she was loved, and she will never be forgotten. Thank you. She's the sweetest little thing there. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing, Shay. And I know you will continue to keep getting, trying to get justice for your mom. Um, I want to invite Miss Lewis. I, I can't never say her name right. Lakishma Lewis. Her son was Keelian Lewis. And um, they want to say a few words. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to speak for my niece on behalf of her son, Keelan Lewis, who was murdered 2017 on Christmas, New Year's Eve. And it took him two and a half years to solve the case. And we just want to give God all the glory for that. He won't return, but like many have said, some have and gotten closure. Some don't know where their children are. But we thank God for the closure. And we thank all the sheriffs, the FBI, the detectives up in Colfax and the ones uh, that here that was here too. And like I say, he was murdered for insurance fraud. Mm -hmm. And he was a young man. And you know, like I say, he forever be in our hearts. And this is his mother. And this is his son, and he has two more children. And like you say, not only we grieving for us, but everyone that's out here. But I would tell my little niece, I would tell her all the time, I said, I don't know if God's gonna leave Amy here. I'm the only living Amy she has left her mother's side. I say, but in my spirit, God tells me you're gonna get closure. Don't ask him why, don't ask him how, don't ask him nothing. A lot of questions you want to ask. I say, but God has already solved this problem. And her Amy lived to see that. She lived to get closure. Yeah. Her son lived to get closure. And the other two girls lived to get closure. And we just want to say, we don't want his name to never be forgotten. We want Keelan Lewis to always be remembered. He was quiet, he didn't bother anybody. He wasn't perfect, the typical young man, but he didn't deserve that. He didn't deserve that. And many more that's sitting out here, injustice has been done. But I do thank God, and I give God all the glory that he has given us some closure, and he has given her a, a peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding. Amen. They still have their moments. I have my moment. But all I can say, along with the rest of you all, to God be the glory. Amen. 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 The glory will never be forgotten. Forever in our lives. That was beautiful. And we're going to um, let Miss Patricia speak, and then that's going to. Then we're going to do our list of names. Um, it was your brother, right? Michael. Her brother was Michael Butler. And I'm going to let her speak a few words. My name is Patricia Curtis. Michael Lewis Butler was my brother. Most people remember him as the Motel 6 murder, but his name was Michael Lewis Butler. Um, August the 10th, 2016, when I was informed he needed to get to Rackings Hospital, my brother informed the police of the ones that had attacked him. But when they went to do surgery, his brain shifted. And they put him on the ventilator. I sat in his room. And I watched my brother go on with a tear in his left eye. I will never forget that moment. Also, I would like to thank Mr. Harris. He 
got justice for us. <coughs> he really put all his effort into it. I just want to thank him. Just want to say, all of us have experienced some kind of way being a victim. So it would take for all of us to get together. We have to pray, put our hands in everything, in the man up above, and all of us. Thank y'all. Thank you so much. Okay, at this time, um, we're going to... To me, this is just the... I don't know, I just... I think about... Yes, me. Hang on just a second. Was Shamika Gornett's family and Shamika and Courtney were friends and um, Shamika's murder still remains unsolved. Um, this is Jason. He lost his brother to murder and he's going to be the bell ringer uh, while I read out the names. Okay. Steve Allen. Tamara Allen, Sophia Argon, Sophia Danielle Ornell, Delrico Lamont Anderson, Andrea Baden, Dalton Berry, Chris Bernard, Isabella Blair, Tanisha Briggs, Roderick Brooks, Edward Brown, Donna Brazell, Shaterica Brewer, Julie Mae Bush, Michael Butler, Stormy Devin Callison, Pamela Cornahan, Jay Carruth, Shayla Carson. Audrey Chalette, Samuel Celestine, Kagrin Clovis, Jeffrey Clovis, Jordan Compton, Keisha Clovis, Courtney Megan Coco, Roderick Collins, Thomas Cootie Jr., Marion Cootie, 
Gregory Allen Craig, Dale DeSale Jr., Tiffany Dalry, Huey Van Dyke, Alan Michael Edwards, Levi Cole Ellerby, Brenton Emanuel, Malik Evans, David Ezernat, Jaiselyn Fields, Lindsey Freeman, Shamika Garnett, Teresa Gilcrease, Anthony Gadsden, Christopher Gibson, Jared Gillian, Daryl Jones Green, Camille Harvey, Dadrian Henderson, Courtney Honore, Johnny Peanut Hargrove, Kendrick Horn, Jarvis Jackson, Frederick James, Linda Call, Colby Michael Knapp, Ray Paul Lashney, Christopher LeBlanc, Keelan Lewis, Jeremy Martis, Daytrick McTwire, Juan Derek McGinnis, JLo McGlory, Lenara McCadney, Ray Ray Mitchell, Joey Giordano, Rebecca Ann Miller, Jeremy Norris, Shanda White Pitney, Tony Lynn Denise Perry, Paul Preen, Victoria Perez, Rita Rabelais, Peter Rachel, Abe Robinson Jr., Shaquina Robinson, Manuel Welch Rue, Lavana Ryland, Ayana Reed, Yvonne Rozier, Stephen Soche, Joseph Stewart, Christy Smith, Amanda Stroud, Anthony Session, Michael Sy, Marty Fields, Quintrella Turner, Christopher Veal Sr., Kristen Weathersby, John Williams, Lonnie Williams Jr., Shantharion Ramon Williams, Arturio White, Latish White, and Elena Zaccaro. And while I, on the last name, last year, we forgot her name and her daughters were here. So if I can get Lakin and Raven to come up for a minute.
I'm so sorry that I forgot y'all's mother's name last year, and it won't ever happen again. That's going to conclude our vigil for tonight. And I want to invite Father Kenneth to come up and say a closing prayer. And may all of y'all find healing and hope in this time of our suffering. But if you look to the left of you, you look to the right of you, you look in front of you, and you look behind you, you are not alone. Thank y'all. Oh, one more thing, sorry. There was a huge dumpster right here yesterday, and Mr. Preston Durr and Mr. Mark Baden teamed up together with the elevator company and had it moved. So I want to say kudos to them for doing that. Thank you all. Let us pray. Oh God, our Creator and Redeemer, have pity on our dearly departed and grant them refreshment, light, and peace in the bliss of your holy presence. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. May they rest in peace. May their souls and all the souls of the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Real Crime is a true crime podcast brought to you by Woody Overton and executive producer Toby Tomplay.